we've got quite a exciting, interesting session this morning uh, around the, the topic of DHS2 and architecture, how DHS2 fits into the architecture of national systems in particular, and what that means. Um, you'll only have to suffer me for four or five slides to give some opinionated views about architecture, and then we get down to the real interesting stuff. So, first of all, the speakers today, besides myself, um, this is the abbreviated list, because all, all, all of these guys come with reinforcements. Um, <laughs> so we have Turin from the Norwegian municipality, who's got a talk to us about their experience, particularly with the COVID response and how they they were faced with with the some interesting challenges of how to fit DHS2 into the rest of the system to deliver the most value for the users and their their work. We got Dr. Wesley Uga from Ministry of Health in Kenya, um, also supported by Ayub and Dennis. And I forgot to mention Andres from, from Norway, and Hiranya Samara Sakera from the ICT agency in Sri Lanka, who, who many of you know have done some very, very exciting stuff also, also around the COVID response. Uh, the order which we're going to go in is not, like, is not that. We, 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 we start with Wesley, then Hiranya. And then, okay, so there's some general thoughts, call them opinions, if you like, as I have the, I have the, I have the floor. <laughs> I'm always interested when people talk, when people talk about architecture, they obviously show me your architecture. And then they show you all kind of boxes and lines and drawings and things. And that's always less interesting in a way because I prefer to think of architecture as that thing, that practice that architects do. They do architecture. Right? So architecture is a process of production. And because it's human production, it's affected by and it affects many things, including things like fashion. We tend to build things which are fashionable. Architecture tends to reflect what's modern or current. Um, it's obviously affected by power and it affects power, right? Architecture directs what people can do, how they can do it. Um, culture, it's not about individuals. Architecture affects uh, us as social human beings. And of course, everyday life. We talk a little bit about everyday life and how architecture has an impact on that. And mostly in terms of our health information system architecture, we're talking about everyday work life, what we do for our jobs. So what do we, when I say architects do architecture and they produce something, what is it that they produce? One thing is fairly obvious and what a lot of people think is, is architecture is those artifacts, often they're pieces of paper diagrams and often they become incarnated into machines but that's only one product of architecture the other product of architecture i've kind of hinted at is it also produces change social relations right the way we interact with each other and kind of importantly architecture produces knowledge architects produce knowledge about architecture and that's why we're really fortunate today because we've got some architects with us in fact, we have a lot of architects out there, and part of the opportunity we have this week is to share together knowledge about architecture. It's kind of more difficult with information system architecture. You know, with, with physical architecture, you can see stuff. And we learn a lot by looking around and seeing how buildings are built and the like. Talking of which, um, town planning. Town planning, interestingly enough, has always had a great, great effect on information systems architecture that a lot of people don't realize. A fellow called Chris Alexander, somebody might know Chris Alexander, who, 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 who talked about architectural patterns. He was a town planner. 
and software engineers took up these ideas of, of having a pattern language and they developed software design patterns. A lot of the software design patterns that a lot of developers are familiar with, they have this root, in fact, in town planning. We learn a lot about architecture, I think, from the built environment and town planning. Um, and it's good that we do because, you know, we've been doing information system architecture for quite a short time, certainly compared to how long we've been building things. They've been doing it for much longer. And I like to, to draw attention, I suppose, a lot of you are in Oslo, I think, for the first time. Some of you have been, been here before. Oslo is a wonderful city to explore. Right? It's easy to walk through. It's becoming even easier now of these electric bicycles and electric scooters. And um, there's a wonderful public transport system. Um, and all of this is not random, right? It was designed to be like that. Right? There's a, I don't, I, I've never met anybody from the Oslo Town Planning Department, but it's very obvious that they're concerned about human beings and their everyday life, how they get to work. Um, how they get pleasure out of things, how they get exercise. Uh, supporting the quality of social and work life. That's what the town plan of Oslo does. And I think that's really what our information systems should be doing as well. And sometimes they can be beautiful as well. They don't have to be ugly. Okay, a little bit about health information systems. Arca. Then, 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 you're, then you're done with me and, and we'll get on to the, the real stuff. Uh, just some lessons, I suppose, from what I've seen working with a lot of countries and their architectural plans. Um, one of the mistakes sometimes people make is they don't realize to what extent they have to take into account existing reality. Right, and people are bored of me saying this, but designing architectural products in heaven and then trying to find a place to fit them on the earth, yeah, is much, much less successful in general than designing things on earth where you approach heaven. And I think we'll see some good examples of that, I hope. It should be driven by use value. In Malkas, mostly to health workers and citizens. Architecture as production, like all other production, really is capitalist society after all. What gets produced is what's paid for, right? Uh, and sometimes what's paid for is not necessarily delivering the most use. It's important to keep attention on where is the use value in the stuff that is built. Complexity needs to be maintained. I see particularly funders think about these big architectural projects and they make a three-year plan to say this is where it starts this is where it's finished and then the plug gets pulled the money stops and nobody's really thought about well how does it carry on um one of the things that that people are which are sometimes surprising is that as architecture grows and evolves, new categories of work also emerge. Um, the kind of jobs that you hadn't realized when maybe you were an initial HISP team doing DHS2 in a country. Um, and now there are different categories of work around things like curatorship of, main, of, of terminologies and, and, and facility registries and those kind of things. They're all work. Standards obviously come up a lot in architecture. I don't think it's going to come up too much today, interestingly enough. Um, some of you who I was chatting with yesterday a little bit about standards. I mean, I, I, there's lots of analogies for standards. I mean, if you're, if you're French, it's standard. It's like the, the thing you go into battle with. <laughs> um, that's actually quite a nice metaphor because it's something that people rally around. Um, standards also as jazz standards, I think is my favorite one. But, you know, if you know a jazz standard and if you have five musicians in a room and they all know the basics of whatever, my funny Valentine, then it allows people to be collaborative and creative and um, still keep to the tune, approximately, deviations. So, yeah, that's my as I say, slightly opinionated introduction to some of the themes of architecture, which I think are 
will emerge in some of the the discussions that we have coming up. The order, I said, we're going to start with you, Wesley, um, and move along. So, thanks for that. Oh, I had something about DHS too. Ah, never mind DHS. You heard, you heard enough about DHS too. <laughs> um, my presenters on the panel will say all of that in their own different ways anyway. I want to move. We're going to do Q&A afterwards. We've got comfortable enough session. We've got an hour and a half. I hope we'll have lots of time for discussion. Thank you. So good morning once again. Good morning. Nah, that is more like this life. So once again, my name is Wesley. I work in the Ministry of Health with my brother, Dr. Ayubanya. I think you'll be able to see him. He's somewhere seated around there. And I'm going to give you a little, a little journey of our interoperability in Kenya so that you can be able to understand where we've been and where we have. So for those of you who are familiar with Kenya, I think we are among the first countries to implement and we piloted DHIS2, I think, for the main part that is back in 2010 in Kuala, when it was moving from DHIS1 to DHIS2. So it's we scaled up nationally as early as 2011, and it's actually our de facto reporting platform. That is to say that any significant health data of importance, you're likely to get it in DHIS2. So with this has come a number of issues, continuous capacity building and technical support, and most importantly, I should say we have about now about 25 data sets about in within our DHIS2. So it's a data, it's more of the landing page where everyone, if at all you're delivering healthcare in Kenya, you'd want your data to be there so that anytime someone asks you, where can I get it? If it's DHIS2, it's well covered. So what has been some of the things that has made our implementation of digital health or even the interoperability very, very well going. First thing is I need to inform you is our constitution of 2010, which outlines the right of information in line with the new current government, which we have is that we have a devolved government. We have a national government. Then we have small 47 governments down there. So the right for information becomes the basis for which each and everything we anchor on, especially on health information, we have to anchor it on that particular part of the constitution. We have our 2020, 2030 vision. And then of late, we've had the Health Act, which has given us the enabling legislation. That is to ensure that number anybody delivering healthcare, in whatever format you're doing it, there are some few things you must be able to send to us so that we can be able to know whether private, whether public, whether faith-based, you're able to share with us some critical data, which is important for, especially as a nation, as we plan towards it. We have also some other things, I think the, establishment of our integrated HIS, telemedicine and the rest. Anchoring all this as we in health is the idea that we all work under ICT. So we have the National ICT Policy 2020. And of late, a very critical thing that has come to throw a curveball within the mix is the Data Act Protection Act. I think those of you who've been familiar with the quest for everybody to look for privacy, to ensure that at least your data is anonymized and nobody else accesses it. That is part of what has really been part of our enabling environment. Lastly, we have the several number of health policies. I will not belabor you with which ones are they, but I will move forward and tell you that our aim to develop an enterprise architecture started in 2015. I think that is when I think a lot of all these open MRS and everyone else was moving in, electronization, digitalization of data and everything. So this is just to remind you so that you, you'll be able to see what has changed. As the previous preventer has told you is that we, this was in heaven. So please have a remember, memory of this when you talk about the heaven. So we had a clear operation of what would be our channels, what would be our business service layer and our technology service. And remember encompassing all this is that we believed we were building it on two foundations. The principles, standards, and policies being a key foundation principle and ensuring that each of those areas will be able to work properly, giving ensuring this procedure and work. Now, that is on earth. <laughs> I'm sure a good number of you will be able to look at it and wonder which is which. 
So I'll be able to look through and tell you this is the central pillar. This is where we have our DHIS2, where everybody else is trying to send their data into it. So if you look carefully, you'll be able to notice that we'll have, for example, information health. This is about the home and resource, which is a key pillar for those who know the building blocks for WHO. We'll be able to send some of their data here, albeit all this data comes as aggregate, not as individual level. We have the Kenya Master Health Facility List, sending its data to KEMSA and also sharing it with it, with our DHIS2. We have the logistical management information system. I think I've seen a good number of counties running the LMIS. Within Kenya, all the, especially the global funded products, malaria, TB, and HIV, it's mandatory that their data must be within DHIS2. So you can see again, all this send their data there. We have the national EMR. After the few countries that are running EMR, and I have to tell you that as a country, one of the few challenges we've had is program-based support. So when I say EMR, I need, I need to tell you that these are HIV-related care and treatment EMR. The other EMR, none of them is sending it. So I think in the morning, as you're talking about electronic, elect, digitalization of health, we were able to appreciate the fact that when it's program-based, malaria comes and runs with it. Halfway through, the funds get over. Then the new boy, in the new kid in the block is TB. He comes, starts a new race, and we go on and on. So we have our EMR. We have our Chanjo, I think the new thing here, covering especially the COVID, the new kid in the block, giving us the summaries of how many people have been immunized, how many are half immunized, fully immunized, all that being sent all through this. And basically, I think you get a grasp of what it is. So we have these two instances. We have a KHIS aggregate. We have two instances, and we have the tracker, which covers events and everything. Just by the look of all these things, I think the tech savvy people will know ERA 502 is very possible because everybody is digging into one particular resource. But just to give you a clue, one of the few challenges we've had is that each of these is, runs a different implementation. The only thing that is a common face is that we have a point-to-point -point structured integration and many sharing data in this particular format, JSON and XML. We have a beauty about it is we have a standard health facility and community unit. That means whoever is sending it, whatever system you're running desperately identifies through one thing. All of you have a master facility list, which is giving you a code, which is linking that particular data to that particular individual or that particular site, which is generating it. We have heavy, a lot of our data exchange across this platform is basically based on API. And some of them as a custom interoperability layer based, and some of them are ADX exchanges. So clearly, if you are with me, you realize standards I know, as my previous person said, standards are strange. And the thing to also remember is that all these technologies are running on different technologies. With DHS2, some running on Open MRS, Open MRS, some running on Iris, Open HIM, Open Concept, all these particular things that we've been able to see. But at least you understand how the earth is. Now, in the current implementations, these are some of the challenges we are actually encountering. We have no control on data integrity and validation measures. As you've seen, everyone decides to send data in a format he knows it will be able to land on the other side. So a challenge becomes our data integrity, and we cannot be able to validate. As long as you've sent us data and it has landed, validation is not, an issue, is not able to be done. A lot of these systems, if you've realized, are actually based on partners and who is supporting what. So if, for example, I come in tomorrow and I'm interested in knowing how many male Kenyans are 40, you'll develop a system here and immediately start sending me data about Kenyan males who are 40. So that becomes a very major challenge, sorry. And then the other thing is limited use of common structures. Everyone, some of these are vendor-based systems, so we do not have any common structures. So this, this in itself has given us minimal usability of use of integration tools. And we lack a centralized coded metadata indicator dictionary. A terminology service layer is a whole new thing, which as we keep learning and as we keep rolling, on, rolling it, we realize it's something that we need to develop. So we have limited tolerance for integration and ended up monitoring, different security profiles on the few data sharing agreement, institutional by these parties, because most of these parties, some of them are government owned. So those of you who've worked in government, especially in the African setup, if it's government to government, someone will just tell you it's the government. Do we really need standards? Your government, I'm government. So those things become the security profiles and the challenges that come with it come in. And the bigger picture, the bigger limitation as we move ahead 
is limited scalability so that we can be able to plan and implement. Everyone is moving in with the thing and everyone wants to be in the system, but the way we've structured it, you cannot be able to make room for growth for it to be expandable. My brother from Rwanda, I think, talked about finding his room by chance. This is a simple explanation of interoperability. Those of you who came like me from Kenya, we only realize in the room we cannot charge our phone, we cannot charge our laptops, because clearly this is probably what I came with, this is how the socket looks like, and I need to develop an interoperability layer to be able to access Norwegian power. So, I'm sure each of you had an experience as you're moving across, but this is now what has made us as Kenya to be able to develop a Kenya health information system interoperability framework. Free, if you, in your free time, you can Google it as it is. You'll be able to get the document and you can see what you're looking at. And we're actually borrowing from what the European interoperability framework is telling us that we should be able to, an interoperability framework is an agreed approach for interoperability for organizations that wish to work together towards the joint delivery of a public service, which as a government is our key aim to be able to give you. So as we were developing this, there are a few things that we realized we need to be able to look at and be able to ensure that we work together. And we borrowed a good part of it from the Open HIM. And we need to promote the use of interoperability concept and the standard and harmonize health information to enhance application interoperability, to introduce appropriate governance mechanism, a very key thing, because governance becomes the next thing when everything has already started running, to, pro to provide an interoperability conceptual framework and to provide guidance on how will we be able to say as Kenya, at which level are we as in interoperability maturity? Are we at the young stage? Are we at middle stage? Or are we nowhere? Because what I have shown you, I don't know where you'll place Kenya, but our guiding principles, I think, you can clearly see them on the right, that we need transparency, usability, neutrality, user centricity, inclusion and accessibility, and the key elephant in the room, security and privacy, and assessment to ensure that the effectiveness and efficiency, and lastly, to ensuring that the integrity of our data is very good. So in doing this, we did realize that the technical parts, if you're not very careful, might not be the only thing we need to look at as we look at interoperability. So the first thing we look at is the legal. As I've told you, Kenya has passed the Data Act, Kenya Data Act 2019, even requiring me not, not to save any personal data outside of Kenya, as much as we have cloud challenges with that. So all those needs to be there. We're also looking at organization level where our policies and care process also fit into this interoperability. We do not want them to exist in the vacuum. We need the semantic. I think I talked about the terminology layer. How well can we be able to say when we're referring to one thing across board, Everyone understands what we're talking about. And then the last, but actually the pillar of it is the technical part, ensuring that the application and the IT infrastructure, anybody trying to deploy something is aware that this particular infrastructure will be able to support interoperability. I think this gives a summary of what I'm talking about, having compatible legislation, agreement with organization, alignment to our care and shared use, definition, and all those. And this we've actually sourced from European Union, and we hope to be able to relay. So after our first heaven, this is our second heaven, which we are currently implementing. And our aim here is, I think you can be able to look at it very well, is that we shall have the different areas in there, the common services, which we have this, things that will be common with everybody. You either have a, re a registry for our partners, our health products and technologies, our health workers, those who are able to access the different health systems, should be able to have a registry for them. A community unit registry, I think health service in Kenya is delivered in two areas. We deliver health service at the community level and at the health facility. So for the health facility registry, I think we already have it. And the community registries, we have it. Whatever we are calling the client registry is something we're looking at as development of a unique identifier for a patient. As a country, we tend to have common names. I don't know if in your country you can get somebody also called Wesley or Oga, but the only the different name is the third name. So Kenya tends to have a lot of that. So we, that's why we're developing a client registry. Sometimes we're calling it a patient registry. And lastly, having a terminology service layer. The business service layer, I think, will be able to go through them, all the different information systems that will be able to share. And then the analytics at the other end, which is mainly to feed our policymakers and the consumers of this information. And our aim is that we shall have 
an interoperability layer line in Downium to allow all these different areas to be able to share this information very, very well. A key thing to mention here is that Kenya is targeting towards going to un universal healthcare. And as such, we're really working to have shared health records. That means if I'm treated in Oslo today and I move to another city, which is within Kenya, the person who's treating me should be able to access my previous medical record. I think very few countries in Africa have been able to do that. And this is an enabler towards you know, universal healthcare so that whatever healthcare you're given, you're able to get it across. We also, being awoken to this lower layer, I think all of you can be able to see this. And a key thing that is becoming, especially for those of us who are managing chronic illness, the mobile apps. We want to be part of what contributes to your healthcare so that if the doctor has told you, please walk 20 kilometers in a month, the four kilometers and five kilometer contributes towards your all universal healthcare so that if the doctor asks you, those of you who've been with patients, if they're asked, have you walked? They always say walk. Yes, I do, do a lot of walking. But with that system, we'll be able to clearly see it to that end. So just in finishing, those are my, my acknowledgement. These are the different people who've participated in this whole step as we try and get into having a good interoperability layer in Kenya. Asanteni is thank you in Swahili. Thanks, Wesley. Uh, you're, you're... I don't know if anybody wants to ask Dennis any, any questions in terms of clarification of, of, of anything. Um, we've got time for maybe one or two, but we'll have more time for discussion then at the end. Question for Dennis. Yeah. Dennis, sorry, you have to come back. <laughs> it's okay. And, uh, I think Dennis, Dennis, Wesley, Wesley. Dennis, who was with us, and, and Ayub will be able to assist me kindly. Please come again. Have we? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hi. You you mentioned Open Concept Lab mm -hmm. as a terminology service. Uh, how was the integration with the different applications you mentioned? So I don't know if you are referring to the new heaven or the old heaven. The new, because, the, new. the new heaven. I think this is now what we are working on. So part of what we are doing, I think, uh, and Dennis will be able to guide me. Can also give Dennis a mic. Is the development of that some terminology layer? So that's not yet. Yeah. No more clarity. Are there any other questions? I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to follow up afterwards. Is there another one? One more, then we'll move on. Yeah, I'm uh, just wondering what technologies you're using for your interoperability layer. Is it uh, custom built or is there anything out there that you, you picked up and used? I believe what you've done is you've developed standards of what should be for you to be able to share within the interoperability layer, we've defined the different standards. And I was able to show the Kenya Health Interoperability Framework. So within it, we've defined the different standards which everyone should be able to achieve to be able to use that particular layer. The layer itself has not been developed. It's a work in progress. So we are hoping that whoever wants to share data at that particular level knows what will be the requirement before they can be able to share data. Thank you. So the layer is still in heaven. I think we'll have to move on, but but, but but in the discussion, you'll have a chance to come in. Thanks, Irania. A very good morning to you, everybody. My name, my name is Irania. Uh, I'm, I'm representing the, the Ministry of Technology of Sri Lanka. Uh, so in this uh, very uh, short uh, presentation, I'm going to share some of uh, our experience building, using DHIS2 
uh, to build uh, the, the national uh, COVID-19 national surveillance system. Uh, so I was the former uh, chief technology officer for the government of Sri Lanka uh, during the height of COVID. So I had I had the opportunity and the privilege, uh, the first time, the privilege to, you know, first hand, you know, um, work with uh, many different uh, entities, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, his Sri, Sri Lanka group, uh, Dr. Pamod, who, who is a representative here, and with various other uh, government uh, organizations uh, uh, to build a, uh, a connected solution uh, in order to, uh, to you know, quickly uh, adopt DHIS2 and, you know, uh, respond to the the challenges of COVID nineteen. Uh, so this is uh, like a forty thousand foot weave of uh, the the Sri Lankan government's uh, uh, digital blueprint. Uh, on the bottom most layer, uh, you can see the the, uh, the blue layer. You can see the the, the foundational layer, the the infrastructure layer. So Sri Lanka is an island nation. It's sixty five thousand, you know. Odd, uh, Square kilometers uh, uh, in size, 20, 22 million population. So Sri Lankan government has taken the initiative to build a uh, uh, build the connectivity uh, to connect um, uh, almost all you know uh, essential uh, government uh, entities across the island. Uh, through uh, something called the Lanka Government Network, uh, which connects uh, these essential you know, organizations, uh, government entities through fiber optic connectivity. On top of that, uh, we have our uh, Lanka Government Cloud, which is a private cloud uh, purpose built and uh, uh, maintained by uh, the government of Sri Lanka to serve uh, the, the, the needs of government uh, uh, government uh, e uh, digital solutions, including uh, the health. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, then uh, the, the third layer, which is the, the newest uh, layer, uh, which is in progress right now, uh, that is the, the Sri Lanka Unique Digital Identity uh, layer, uh, together, with the, <clears throat> together with our interoperability layer, which we call the National Data Exchange. So th that layer is still uh, a work in progress. Uh, in green, you, have, you can see the shared solutions. On top of that, you can see the, the orange layer, which, is, which are more sector specific. Domain specific, or as we call it, line of business uh, solutions, which are <clears throat> like health, education, uh, motor traffic, you name it, right? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so the ICT agency of Sri Lanka is is a fully owned uh, institution, uh, fully government owned institution, uh, which is uh, which is the apex body for all things ICT, information, communication, and technology. So uh, they are responsible to realize that uh, the, the, the previously shown uh, blueprint, the government digital government blueprint, uh, to come up with public policies uh, with related to digital uh, and ICT, and uh, to create a sort of an enabling environment in terms of uh, digital laws. Uh, I'm happy to say in 2022, uh, we were uh, success we successfully uh, enacted the, the Personal Data Protection Act, uh, which is you know a few months, couple of months uh, ago. Uh, we are very happy uh, and we are very pleased to have that uh, in place. And uh, I mean, com comparatively uh, in South Asia, I think uh, Sri Lanka has a really good uh, uh, you know set of digital laws. We we have the Electronics Transactions Act, we have the Cybersecurity Laws, etc. So we are I think uh, very well positioned in that sense. Uh, so I want to spend more you know, put, put more emphasis and focus on the governance of uh, uh, of the, the role of the ICT agency, uh, especially from, from the point I, I sat uh, during the COVID-19 uh, solution. <clears throat> so it was a humble beginning, right? You know, it was uh, in January, 2020, in the very early days of uh, the, the spread of COVID in, in Sri Lanka, uh, it all started here in a very low key, you know, in a small room, uh, Few, uh, you know, tech enthusiasts uh, and engineers got together and to to you know sort of come up with a uh, very high level concept <clears throat> to to sort of design a concept, uh, which translated into a, like a Google Doc, which we opened it up uh, for public comment, and we from there onwards, I mean, we ended up with this one, right? So 
so this this uh, opening up of that uh, that google doc or the concept and um, opening it up for comments and collaboration uh, created a, a huge you know sort of a movement uh, we gathered uh, a lot of volunteers you know like in the, in the tech enthusiasts domain experts from all walks of life from all you know different professions uh, and uh, and uh, we were able to you know uh, to come up with a very um, very elaborate uh, um, you know, ecosystem of solutions. Uh, I shamelessly copied this slide from Dr. Pamo's uh, yeah, <laughs> presentation yesterday. Uh, so as you can see, uh, DHIS2 uh, became an integral part of uh, this entire ecosystem. This was a very conscious decision. I'm really happy from um, as a C as the former CTO that uh, we made that con conscious decision to you know build around uh, DHIS2 and. Uh, as you can see, we started off with, uh, you know, systems to track, you know, you know, tourists, you know, flowing into the to the country through ports of entries. So we had, uh, you know, department of, department of immigration involved. We had so many systems, uh, which are built and operated by different silos, especially immigration. I don't think they they were, they haven't uh, at that time. I don't think they were open. They haven't. Uh, they have not open their systems to a, a level uh, like at this scale so so we had to undergo uh, through a lot of you know challenges uh, for obvious reasons um, so all these you know components those all these systems were you know in isolation of course there were you know new solutions like uh, you know icu bed management and uh, there were a lot of uh, new net new you know solutions that came into the picture but behind these there were actual organizations you know uh, government entities who are uh, who were you know uh, in control of some of the data civil registries department of immigration hospitals ministry of health you name it there were so many different organizations so as the ict agency so ict agency is empowered uh, to to you know sort of be that you know uh, conduit uh, across the government uh, so we had the mandate as well as the authority I, I would say but here in this case uh, with the with the uh, uh, with covid uh, happening i think uh, we were uh, we were lucky that uh, most of these entities were open enough uh, to to you know collaboratively work with us and uh, and uh, ict played more of a uh, uh, facilitator rather than a more of a uh, uh what do you say uh, so so more than an authority we, we were playing a sort of a supportive role there i must say um uh, obvious for obvious reasons we did not have uh the the required uh, uh human capacity uh to build most of these solutions in, in record time as you know uh, uh, like most government entities we i mean when we build systems you will have to go through procurements and tenders, et cetera, right? Here, we had to react very, very quickly with zero budget, right? So uh, so the the efforts, the, the, the voluntary efforts uh, that were put, uh, you know, helped really well. So we built a community uh, around this. Um, so coincidentally, uh, the ICT agency had uh, this program, GovTech, uh, GovTech LK program running. So we were at the very early stage of uh, that. So this was a, the, the idea of this was to uh, create a sort of a uh, community, of a, like a voluntary community, an open community around uh, uh, building government technology, technologies for the government, uh, for, for the people. Uh, so, so most of uh, these uh, tech enthusiasts, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, developers, uh, designers, project managers, all of them sort of gathered around this virtually. <clears throat> Luckily, uh, I mean, with, with the advent of COVID, uh, most were, you know, you know, uh, locked, um, you know, locked into their uh, homes. Uh, since most of the tech, uh, tech guys were already very familiar with uh, working from home, working remotely. So we had, and they had a lot of surplus time. Uh, and uh, so, so we were lucky. So we, we were able to tap tap into their you know uh, their their brains uh, remotely and uh, so we collaborated virtually so we had uh, uh, so we had uh, slack groups through github uh, we shared code uh, through through different other collaboration tools uh, so we were able to uh, engage uh, really uh, actively this slack group uh, uh, played a pivotal role <clears throat> um, uh, so we had about 500 uh, volunteers 
connecting Sri Lankan volunteers, connecting from all over the world, even even expats living in US, um, Singapore, Australia, and we had DHIS two, uh, some of the core DHIS two members, you know, contributing like Austin, Bob, uh, and uh, there were so many uh, public officials from uh, government entities who were, you know connected to this and they were actually witnessing how these th systems were getting built so that was a, a very uh, uh, a very uh, enlightening uh, experience for most of the uh, the folks uh, especially those who were in the government who have been who have never experienced that kind of a movement or like a collaboration uh, happening in an open manner uh, uh, and it's and it was almost uh, actually free I mean, they were people were contributing their labor um, out of passion. Uh, so we were building systems uh, in an open manner. So as the ICT agency, of course, we were sometimes uh, uh, liaising with uh, some of the uh, integrating with some of the sensitive systems. So we had to, you know, play a sort of a uh, significant role there to ensure the, the data security, make sure that the the the, 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 the integrations are done in a, in a like a secure uh, and, and and reliable manner, etc. And ICT agency was providing uh, the the infrastructure. Uh, remember the Lanka government network and the Lanka government cloud. So those uh, really helped us, you know, quickly you know roll out you know provide infrastructure uh, required. Um, for the DHIS2 uh, and other, you know, peripheral systems, integrated systems to, you know, come to light in record time. So DHIS2, so uh, during this, uh, this, the, the, this, this uh, conference event, uh, we've been talking about DHIS2 a lot. So uh, especially for COVID-19, but beyond that, I think uh, the, the, the Sri Lankan government, um, is, is now seeing the possibilities, the various different other possibilities of uh, DHIS2. Uh, unfortunately, at this moment, Sri Lanka is going through a little bit of a, a rough time uh, in terms of economic uh, situation. Uh, so we are uh, seeing real, you know, uh, problem, you know, challenges um, uh, with regards to agriculture and food security. So with the inroads, the successful inroads that uh, DHIS2 is making, um, uh, to the education system, I think this is an uh, this is really interesting uh, from a, from the government's point of view. We are really keen on um, uh, uh, seeing the possibilities of using DHIS two in agriculture, food security, uh, disaster management, nutrition, and climate, etc. I think uh, uh, DHIS two is all already in in uh, use in disaster management right now. But we we like to you know see how we can you know uh, go to the the next level. <clears throat> uh, so with the with the possible increased adoption of uh, DHIS2 in other uh, sectors, I think uh, the HISP, uh, HISP uh, group uh, will have to play uh, like a significant role. Uh, I heard uh, during the, the earlier presentations that uh, capacity building is, is key. So uh, even from the government uh, point of view, so we really believe that uh, building capacity in the age organizations uh, really work. Uh, wherever we have not, you know, built that capacity, we have seen the adoption, you know, uh, plummet and, you know, eventually the systems, you know, uh, become redundant, right? So the capacity building is really crucial. So, I mean, we we, we are really keen on, from the government point of view, we are really keen on uh, exploring how we can, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, work closely with uh, the HISP Sri Lanka uh, and other associated groups to see how we can, you know, really take it to the next level. Uh, from an architectural point of view, uh, we are seeing uh, more possibilities of DHIS2. So there, there, there are a lot of uh, DHIS2 solutions, uh, systems, information systems being used in silos, uh, in, in, in thematic areas. So DHIS2 can really act as a sort of a data warehouse or like a data aggregator where we can have uh, uh, analytics uh, and insights, you know, uh, you know, showcased at, at a very uh, aggregate level. <clears throat> And uh, and also as a platform. Uh, so uh, if I if I refer back to the, the the larger digital government blueprint, we have a lot of uh, you know foundational um, solutions. So here you can see one of the foundational solutions that we have. This is called the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Uh, so this has been uh, there for some time uh, in Sri Lanka. So we have about 120 plus uh, you know ge geo layers. Uh, so so uh, systems like DHIS2 can definitely you know feed uh, data into uh, this uh, our NSDI infrastructure. 
Then we have our open data portal, right? Quite so we can. Uh, the, the idea is to have so sort of mashups, so that we can you know build on top of DHIS2 and use DHIS2 uh, as a platform. So we are really uh, you know keen on exploring uh, the the possibilities of uh, DHIS2 different arrangements uh, in the larger uh, in the national you know uh, ecosystem of uh, solutions. Uh, so the DHIS2, as the epidemiology of the, the COVID-19 uh, you know, uh, uh, changed, uh, the DHIS2 was ultimately, uh, at the latter stage, uh, was used for the, the COVID-19 vaccination immunization program. So almost all the 22 million uh, citizens were um, uh, logged on DHIS2. And actually, DHIS2 was you know, really pushed to its boundaries. And, and most of the, uh, the co-engineers know that we've been bothering them with, with a lot of questions um, and uh, we were really happy uh, uh, that that we were able to you know push it to the boundaries and so then uh, we had the challenge of uh, we had the need of uh, building a uh, vaccination certificate so we wanted to make it a smart vaccination certificate uh, so the at the ground level at the field level uh, the, the the people were the citizens were issued uh, like a paper based a cardboard based you know <clears throat> the vaccination certificate which was not good enough especially for uh, foreign travel so we have a uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of sri lankans you know working overseas um, and uh, so that 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 uh, vaccination certificate was unfortunately not good enough uh, as a reliable uh, you know um, means to you know pr prove prove their you know uh, vaccination level therefore uh, so since we had all the records, immunization records on DHIS2, um, uh, with the Ministry of Health, HISP, uh, we came up with uh, the smart vaccination certificates. We built it using the DIVOC. DIVOC is another digital public good uh, that is out there. It's from the EGAO Foundation. Um, DIVOC is a pretty you know big you know uh, solution with uh, which which is very featureful. It's very you know um, widely used in India. Uh, however, uh, for Sri Lanka, <clears throat> we only relied on its uh, 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 verifiable credentials. So as you can see, this uh, uh, this QR code. That's why we call it a smart vaccination certificate. It's that QR code can be scanned independent of any any uh, other third party system so the scanner will you know quickly scan and it, you know, the, the scanner will show you uh, the number of vaccinations that you have got etc without having to uh, connect to a, like a third party system so that so we have to date we have issued i think in upwards of uh, 700000 certificates we have limited it for only um, foreign travel right now um so so we are very happy that uh, we were able to you know uh, extend the capabilities of dhis2 now this smart vaccination certificate can be issued from dhis2 itself uh then uh we are uh using mosip mosip is a modular open source uh, identity platform um so sri lanka had a, a really um, good uh, identity card, national identity card system uh, since 1970s. So we have almost 100% coverage. Um, and uh, however, to to meet uh, the, the the future needs, like you know, future digital needs, if the government is to serve uh, its people through uh, through um, uh, electronic services, digital services, we really need to be able to identify identify. Uh, its citizens uh, digitally so um so sri lanka has has been you know have been you know trying to come up with a electronic version of the national identity card <clears throat> for 12, 12 15 years but unfortunately for various reasons uh, it didn't work out but since in 2019 uh, we uh, made a like a huge pivot and you know decided okay we are going open like you know we are not going to uh, do build this identity the reason that it was you know dragging for so long uh, and uh, we decided and now we have made a, a, a proof of concept as of 2020 uh, and uh, right now we have successfully done two uh, uh, isolated POCs uh, sorry pilots uh, using a telecommunication and a banking uh, use case and we are making progress and um, and uh, we are really happy that we are um, committed to 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 MOSIP. <clears throat> um and yeah uh so i mean uh, so this is a so this shows uh, uh, uh sri lanka's commitment uh, to uh, digital public goods and we are very uh, serious about using open source so, so we have been using open source for quite some time uh 
and uh, and it's but but we take a more pragmatic approach uh, even even the most uh, so the foundation layer uh, will be uh, open based on open standards uh, and open technologies and but we are that doesn't mean that we are not open for, for proprietary uh, you know technologies uh, but uh, in the biometric uh, because this will be based on biometrics uh, iris uh, facial and uh, fingerprint so that will require a lot of uh, support from uh, uh the the uh, the commercial uh vendors as well yeah thank you very much thanks Rania. That, that was really fascinating uh, i'm sure there's tons of questions people want to ask but maybe we should move on to the next one we'll have a little bit of time at the end um, nobody's talked about power yet but it's all there in those boxes. So this is a really, really, really fascinating presentation coming up now, I think, from the, the way in which DHS2, somewhat historically, got used in Norway as part of the COVID response. Um, Lauren, over to you. I'll leave you to introduce your colleague. I will. Thank you so much for the invitation. We are very happy to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Tore Moschander, and I work in KS. KS is the Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Authorities. I'm here with my colleague, Anders Halmrast, who works in Bærum Municipality. We're going to share our experience on DHIS2 with you today. Um, our on-premises installation are named Fixed Smittesporing. In Norway, uh, all the municipalities are responsible for tracing and following up each person that are involved. You can check mine. Okay, that's okay. Okay. I'll try once more. Sorry. Uh, my shirt is too long. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm here with my uh, colleague, Anders Holmras, who works in Banu Municipality. We're going to share our experience on uh, DHIS2 with you. Uh, our on-premises installation are named Fixed Smittesporing. In Norway, all the municipalities are responsible for tracing and following up each infected person and their close contacts individually. To prevent outbreaks in the community. And then I use this. When the pandemic hit Norway, March 12, 2020, government enforced the most restrictive measurements in modern history, which in all practicality meant a complete lockdown. No preschools, no schools, and everybody had to work from home. The municipalities were responsible for tracing the COVID-19 and prevent it from spreading. This means that the contact tracer will call everyone that has tested positive for COVID-19 and all their close contacts. It's a huge amount of work. Common for everyone, they had no system support, only pen and paper or Excel. 356 municipalities serving 5.4 million people had the same issue, no system. One nation, one user story. As a contact tracer, I want a system to register positive COVID-19 tests and help me keep track of the spread of COVID-19. This will help us to stop the outbreaks and gain control. 
An uh, employee in Tromsø had knowledge to DJ2, and after some research, a few municipalities and KS started the DJ2 journey. All through the pandemic, fixed meters boarding continuously developed to be the best system support for contact tracer in the municipalities. Norway has several national registries that contains important information that is useful and necessary in tracing COVID-19. Let's have a look. First, we have the MSIS laboratory database. Here we will find all the positive and negative test results on COVID-19 tests in Norway. We have the electronic population database. Here we will find information about everybody that's living in Norway. With the personal ID number, we can get the personal person's address, phone number, and email address. We can also obtain information about relationships, such as parental responsibility for children. And finally, we got the SISVAC. SISVAC gives us individual vaccination status on all the inhabitants in Norway. This provides contact tracers important information in their daily work. By aligning all the data from the national registries, they would have the best overview of where to take action first. How do we use this information? We do a search in the MSIS laboratory database. Who in my community on COVID-19, the results from the MSIS laboratory database will be enriched with the personal information from the electronic population database. And two. This gives the contact tracers time to focus on the important things. Instead of using time manually registration. And the contact tracer can easily make a search to the SISVAC to get the vaccine status imported as well. Then the contact tracers easily can eliminate and close everyone who is fully vaccinated and focus on the ones that are exposed or vulnerable and need extra care. Anders, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience after you changed the system to fix Smith's wedding. Yes, thanks. Uh, <coughs> my microphone is on, I can hear. Uh, yes, thank you, Torun. Um, in the early stages of the pandemic, Bærum developed uh, their own program. It was meant to be a tool for the contact tracers to register uh, the people who was infected and keep track of all their uh, close contacts in our municipality. And for a while, this program worked quite well, but that was in a small scale. As soon as the index numbers started to grow, flaws within the program started to pop up. And one of the biggest flaws was the lack of integration with other programs and other uh, IPS. To know who was infected, the laboratory had to call the contact tracer and name the security number of every individual with a positive test result and spell out their every single name and their home address. When you got up to a thousand positive tests a day, uh, this simply takes too much time both for the laboratory and for the contact tracer. In our old program, we also had to search for people's phone numbers in the yellow pages. We had to look up people on Facebook to see if it was the right person we were talking to. And uh, sometimes we even had to call the hospital or the emergency room uh, and use their valuable time just to get a hold of a phone number. And uh, this process alone could, in some cases, take up to half an hour. 
Regarding the inhabitants' um, vaccination status, we simply had to trust and rely on the information we were given from each individual person. And that was, of course, a major flaw, especially when so many of Norway's uh, restrictions were based on how many vaccines you had taken and when you, had got, uh, when you got them. So Bærum started the search for new programs. And fixed meat spooding and DJI's 2 uh, was the one we went for. And it soon turned out uh, that the amount of interoperability <clears throat> in DJI's 2 was just what we needed. Uh, the two programs were quite alike in front end, uh, but with DJI's 2, we just had to push two buttons to get all the information previously uh, named. And that meant that uh, we, the contact tracers, were able to use almost all our time on what we were supposed to do, which was to contact people who was infected, find out where uh, they got infected, and of course, uh, might, uh, find out who they might have been affected. Uh, and as a positive uh, side effect of this uh, interoperability, the data quality became much better, of course. We no longer had uh, problems or issues with the uh, data entry errors like we used to. And for the first time, uh, we could actually trust all the information within our program. And then the Omicron variant came. And everything was turned upside down. Each inhabitant had to register positive rapid test instead of taking the test at a health institution. That was a game changer. We developed uh, a self-registration solution with secure logon in less than three weeks. Inhabitants could now register rapid test results and close contacts themselves. And again, we used the national registers to increase the data quality and security. The inhabitants could only register positive tests on their own and based on relation registered in the electronic population database. Inhabitants with bad intention was not able to make fake registration that would have caused more strain on the municipalities. The inhabitants registration creates a record with all the personal detail already filled out together with the rapid test result Details about the illness harvest in the self-registration form were also transferred to DJIs2. Anders, what impact did this have on your daily work? Yeah, uh, as you just said, uh, the self-registration uh, uh, was an absolute game changer uh, for us. We no longer had to call every index, but we could use the information from the self-registration form to filter out those most important to us. That led to a prioritization list of who we ought to contact, made by the chief physicians in our municipality. And here you can see that uh, prioritization list. And the reasoning behind this one was that almost all others were able to find the correct information by themselves. And if not, they could simply call our COVID-19 information center. The people on this list, however, were inhabitants that might needed some extra care, some extra advice, and where a COVID-19 infection could have the highest consequences. This was also the stage of the pandemic where we re really realized the value of the working lists within the program. Uh, after a short while, they simply became essential to our workflow. Uh, and this was especially cemented when uh, we were able to assign different indexes to certain contact tracers within the program. So to put it simply and to answer uh, Torin's question, uh, question, the self-registration uh, helped us to reach out to those who needed our help the most and it helped the contact tracers to work more efficiently. Yeah, 
Due to the interoperability mentioned earlier, we now had quite a lot of reliable data in our program. Uh, for example, age, addresses, vaccination st status, and so on. This was used to generate statistics and quickly became one of the most important decision-making tools and management tools for, the, for those responsible for how we, as a municipality, handle the infection and what restrictions were necessary at what time. For the school system, we generated tables, graphs, and lists of how many pupils and how many teachers uh, were infected uh, on each school. We did the same thing for the kindergartens and for the health services, uh, for example, the nursing homes. And with the help of uh, the event reports and the data visualizer tools, uh, um, the municipality's chief physicians were able to monitor uh, the situation in Bærum in real time, which meant that they could take control and act at a much earlier stage than ever before. Some of this information was also uploaded, uploaded on the municipality's uh, own website so that the inhabitants could get updated uh, statistical information about the pandemic in Bærum. And this was something the public was extremely happy about and gave the contact tracers and the government uh, in the municipality a lot of goodwill. The inhabitants, they felt that we were transparent and they got a better understanding of the local restrictions that was imposed. And uh, as, as a side note, uh, a month ago, we, we actually got a, an award for this solution. And the municipality is now considering making similar dashboards for other services. And, uh, <laughs> yes. and uh, to us, this uh, actually shows us the importance of uh, using systems with uh, good interoperability. And as we have heard, and we are looking forward to hearing more about the experiences of others uh, who use uh, DJIS2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I think we have about 20 minutes. I'm sure there's 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 lots emerging from from these discussions. They're very, very different presentations highlighting very, very different aspects of of the architectural journeys and different architects. I know we said that we might get some support up front. Um, I don't know, Dennis, are you here? Yeah, there is Banga. Oh, there he is. Pomod. <laughs> and I was going to say Ayub, but I think we've run out of seats. Oh, well. <laughs> Ayub, we have a seat for you, of course. So there you go. I've got lots of thoughts and questions, but I want to put this over to you. Do we have a microphone? Uh, yeah, so that's this one on the stage. Not very nice, but it's interesting. Okay, if anyone has questions in the audience. Thank you very much for the really inspiring presentations. I have a question for the last group in Norway. Um, as you said, um, you have like different uh, municipalities working with uh, the same issue. Did you have um, uh, one big installation for Norway 
and different organization units within the same systems, or there were different systems, one for each uh, municipality? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one installation for all the municipalities. Uh, there are different... Um, uh, so 150 municipalities in Norway use our installation. And because of the privacy legislations uh, and so on, each uh, municipality has their own uh, kind of workspace. Uh, and uh, uh, for instance, I cannot see what the other municipalities are working on but we can uh, send indexes, we can send uh, close contacts uh, to each other, uh, if that is necessary. Yeah. If you have a question, raise your hand. How do you have uh, between Asker Bærum? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. We we um, we had to. Um, us, she mentioned Oscar and Barrenum. That's two close municipalities uh, with a border between them, and um, there are uh, a lot of uh, people who work uh, in one of the municipalities and live in another. So it's quite common to have uh, more uh, close contacts uh, in the opposite. Uh, municipality. So um, Oscar uh, started this whole the DJI's two journey, and we came along after uh, after a year or so. And uh, for them, uh, we uh, we helped them by joining DJI's two because uh, they no longer had to call us, stand in the uh, phone line queue. Uh, and so on, they could simply push the button and transfer indexes and um, close contacts to, to us. Uh, and of course, we, we had some, um, uh, we, had so, we had to talk together, of course, uh, sometimes, but uh, the, these talks were now more of how to do things together than uh, just uh, giving information. Thanks. This, <clears throat> I'm Mike, the, the product manager for Tracker. I wanted to direct towards Sri Lanka first to say, I think the community owes Sri Lanka quite a bit uh, for all of the efforts you did around COVID. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences and working with us. We also, as a platform, we learned a lot about performance and have uh, tried to be responsive and then bring the fixes that we learned back into the platform. I wondered if you had any thoughts now after having built from nothing to 22 million uh, registrations, things that you would do differently or recommend to other countries that are now moving towards this kind of scale, what would be kind of some key recommendations if they're going to get to that level? Um, I think I have my audio, yes. Right, uh, so I can start and uh, probably Rani can contribute. Uh, so looking back, uh, one crucial decision we had to take uh, in the early days of pandemic, I think in, uh, in, in, in uh, February itself, was like we were using uh, like, for most of our isolated DHS2 instances run by programs, we have been using Ministry of Health standalone servers. So that was our first option. And we, in fact, uh, did it that way when we were doing the, uh, uh, the first prototype. But the thing is, like, if we had opted to, uh, I mean, go on that path, even for the immunization, we would have been in trouble because... Uh, it, I mean, looking back, I think it was a good decision for us to uh, opt for the government uh, cloud because it was very scalable and it has too much of resources. Because, uh, I mean, I'm not uh, going to share the exact spec of the uh, so, I mean, the DHS2 instances uh, that we are running at the moment, but uh, for many reasons, we are using a lot of processing power and uh, RAM. And uh, if we had uses, used the uh, DHIS, I mean, the Ministry of Health service, the standalone service, we would have been in major trouble. And on the other hand, the ICT agency, which manages the cloud, uh, they have their own dedicated resources and they have uh, the network engineers and all who could, uh, I mean, kind of manage it. So, so 
that's about this uh, server part of it. And when it, when it comes to other performance issue, one uh, a good thing that we did was like we identified it before, and then we uh, engaged with the DHS to core team at uh, UIO, because uh, I mean it's not like uh, all of a sudden your DHS two system fails and you try to reach out for support, it won't work. So uh, probably like what I would advise you is to kind of have some monitoring tools and to predict what might happen in future and engage beforehand because I mean, you know, they have so many other tasks that uh, they already do in addition to a supporting country. So you have to predict what is going to happen early and engage in support. And the other thing, share your stories, right? I mean, you are not going to be the first one who's going to uh, encounter the same issue. And probably there may be other people in the community who have had the same issue. And, and again, I think even for the core team, it, it would make more sense to support on issues that uh, more, more, more countries are having than a very specific issue a single country is having. So these are some uh, main concerns that, I mean, like main learnings from uh, whatever we went through, but uh, 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 kind of, uh, I must appreciate the support of uh, the core team because uh, like, uh, maybe exactly one year ago and what it is now, there have been major improvements uh, when it comes to uh, our performance. So that's something I have from my end and uh, Yeah, I, I think uh, getting onto the cloud, the Tanaka government cloud helped us a lot because uh, unfortunately we did not have a lot of, you know, uh, time to, you know, sort of test things out. I mean, in, in, in a perfect situation, we would go to, uh, in a perfect situation, uh, uh, we, we could have, uh, done testing, uh, etc., and go live. But uh, due to the urgency, so we had to, you know, put it to test, put it to task in production. So I think one learning is like, uh, I think if we can uh, do it in a more methodical manner, so as in test it uh, in in an isolated, you know, simulated environment. So. Um, and uh, so having it on the cloud uh, helped us, you know, alleviate some of the problems because we were just throwing infrastructure at the problem. So which helped us in the, the short term and until we figure out. And clustering uh, is, of course, I mean, uh, horizontal scalability is important. Uh, I think we tried out with uh, clustering setups. And uh, well, I think I think in hindsight, I think we could have, could have done a little bit of optimization on the Postgres side. I must also mention, uh, like, they were very receptive to Bob's comments i think bob is still critical about uh, some disk performance when it comes to the servers we are using but they are very receptive they are trying to address it uh, but I, I know like with this present sri lankan situation economic crisis it may not be possible yeah, yeah it, it, well, uh, like i mentioned in my presentation it did you know uh, hit the limits of our cloud as well <laughs> so so uh, we so we had we you know uh, provision some ssds if i can remember right uh, to again you know you know it probably share the problem to, to solve it uh, and yeah yeah thanks so maybe i can share briefly about kenya so the maturity and the evolution of the dhs2 has come a long way uh, looking at it went past and uh, scaled up nationally in 2011. Uh, and uh, at that moment, uh, we the use was mostly aggregate or the essential data sets at that time. And then more programs started onboarding the, the platform. And uh, we started implementing different programs for maternal uh, and also for impatient mobility. So it happened now, uh, more facilities started uh, reporting impatient mobility within the the platform and you see the maturity also it's evolving at that time mostly the aggregator was uh, the main thing and then also the tracker uh, around 2015 uh, started having more features which were supporting country implementation and also country needs and uh, with the implementation of now impatient within the same system and see now we have aggregates and tracker not tracker events uh, which is also in the tracker domain being implemented also on the same system yeah, it came to a point whereby the two systems, the two programs would, would not run in the same platform because the tracker was so heavy on the on computing resources that are needed. And so the ministry had to make a decision to separate those entities. And also at that point also, we were having the Data Protection Act 
which was being developed because the inpatient also was collecting. And so on the performance of so the ministry also had to invest also in resources in terms of being able to yeah, have more resources on the tracker and also separate those two entities into different servers and also continuously see how to improve. I think now the two instances are run separately, but integrated when it comes to aggregation or the aggregate indicators which need to go to the tracker. Yeah, so, but for the Kenyan use case uh, was the separation of concerns based on the maturity of the infrastructure. Yeah, thank you. Dennis, can I ask a question? Uh, we actually have a question from the audience if you want to go to the first tour. Okay. Go on. You can go. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis I'm, really, I'm really conscious of the difficulty of your heaven and earth problem. Um, one of the things that seem to characterize both what's happening in Sri Lanka and what's happening in Norway is very strong ICT agency in Sri Lanka providing cross-government sort of enterprise support, which makes it easier for accessing the population register, for example, and things like that. Do you have any comments about that in terms of where you are in terms of cross-ministry, cross-government collaboration? Do you have an ICT agency like Sri Lanka? Uh, yes. Yeah. So still when it comes to the governance in, in our country, yeah, we have an ICT authority that is responsible in terms of uh, controlling what the different government entities are uh, having or when it comes to the infrastructure, when it comes to also maybe the, the also providing some common services to the different entities within the government. So there is that body that's able to, to do that. But also looking at now back to what Wesley talked about, the constitution that we have uh, that acts as a, the, the blueprint for our country. It, uh, it outlines uh, also some authority also when it comes to the county governments. So they also have like uh, the healthcare is devolved. So you find also with, within them also, they have also a ministry of, IC, of ICT, even within the county governments. And also we have the over anchoring uh, body uh, of, of ICT also within the country. So there's that regulation, but what the national does is creating policies and disseminating reg regulations. So that's aligned. And so what the other ministry is trying to do is to align to those uh, different uh, regulation and different policies that are there. But now to our scenario, when it comes now to the integration with, between different entities, uh, I know Wesley is going to share uh, uh, briefly on that. I think we'll have time for one more question. Was keeping everyone from lunch. Okay. Wes Wesley's going to comment. Yes. So my comment that is said, what were the lesson learned? What would you have you done better? I think one of the few things that happened, especially with our earth, different from heaven, is the idea of failure to plan, knowing where we're going. Because it's more of like, today I want data on LMIS, on DHIS, that comes on top. Tomorrow you need data from the lab, it comes on top. So we realized that the fact that we had the agency of just ensuring everything lands in DHIS, means we did not plan, we did not have an infrastructure, we did not have standards, and we're more interested in the end, just saying, we have the data in the DHIS, please go and have a look at it. So that's one thing we'll be able to learn. And the major thing which we're learning as we move ahead is the impact of legislation. A lot of these things have happened, and then, boom, 2019, we have the Kenya Data Act. So I think if you do remember that legislation, innovation tends to come the way before the legislation. So the legislation either disrupt, interrupt, or reorganize you. So if you plan with that in mind, I think it really makes a lot of sense for those particular products. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks. Mark Landry, Global Fund. Uh, just similar uh, question around governance I had, uh, building on what Bob asked. Um, in Kenya, with your HIS interoperability framework, you have that uh, HIS, I think you refer to it as the... Um, Interagency Coordination Committee, and I know in Sri Lanka you're looking towards your, your architecture blueprint, but what's functioning? How is it working? How is the governance of this? When you go from your as-is architecture to your to-be architecture, uh, 
how, how is that being managed and oversight being implemented? How is the coordination going? What's working? What's not? What are your pain points, et cetera? So, for example, if you remember the, the area where I looked about the registries and the rest, a good number of them are working, but the issue is now they're not sharing data. And the challenge I'll be able to show you, tell you previously is that as we exist at the moment, we have not have an enabling framework that manages knowing who works to who, who responds to who. We have a new constitution outlining different registries, not giving us who will be the overall in charge. So some of the silos that probably have been essential for service delivery, for example, the Kenya Master Facility Registry, the product registry are in existence. Now, how you get them to work together for that common purpose of having an interoperable thing is now what becomes a challenge because no one is the overarching authority. Everyone is independent. So a lot of things are based on goodwill. So if the product people do not want to share their master list, there's nothing you can do. You just have to hope that one day they'll realize they need some data from you. When they need the data from you, so you tell them, please give me the health product registry in next So that is part of the problem. Then we also have to say that the governance structure and the governance of such systems, we are yet to polish it up because we have different actors managing different things. The Health Act, as we speak at the moment, has parts of it implemented, parts of it not implemented. We have the Kenya Data Act, which has been established at the Office of the The Data Commissioner is now covered with vulnerability. That will be the situation in Kenya. Maybe Sri Lanka? Yeah, so from Sri Lanka's case, uh, yes, I mean, we uh, ICT, the ICT agency has been positioned really well uh, uh, to to address it, you know, across uh, the government, uh, but it, it, uh, not without its challenges, right? We do have challenges, uh, especially when governments change. Uh, so we have to, you know, kind of refresh uh, that, that mandate. So uh, especially with the incumbent government, uh, I think they have positioned uh, the ICT agency, repositioned the ICT agency uh, and emphasized the role of ICT agency to sort of achieve the, the whole of government, you know, uh, uh, approach. Um, on top of that, along with the, the, the digital government blueprint, uh, the ICT agency has come up with an engagement model, right? So the engagement model that you saw there uh, with volunteers is just one engagement model. Similarly, we have engagement models to, uh, so the, the number one is uh, the ICT agency takes care of certain elements, that is the foundational layer. So the, uh, the entire foundational layer, the connectivity, the, 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 the private cloud, private cloud, government cloud, uh, the, the digital identity, like, you know, foundational layers is completely taken care of by the ICT agency. Uh, the shared ones and the line of business ones uh, is more collaborative with the line agencies. So therefore, uh, we have uh, publicized a sort of a, a engagement model, so which is uh, well known uh, in the in the government uh, organizations. So that's uh, so basically we have that future state architecture or the blueprint. So that's where we are, you know, sort of uh, walking towards. Yeah. I think our participants are just getting warmed up now. <laughs> it's time for lunch. Uh, I, I think a very very warm thanks to everybody who's contributed. Uh, I think one, one thing that it shows is that we are missing the fact is, is we don't have enough forums to discuss architecture. We've got to make a very conscious effort to do that in the year ahead.